I want to introduce tonight's speaker, Mike Weber. Mike is a popular returning speaker for the museum, and he has a long history and love of Cornwall. As a child, he collected rock and mineral specimens from in and around the waste rock piles, and that led him to a study of geology. As a 1982 geoscience graduate from Penn State, Mike worked for 36 years as a geologist, health physicist, and manager for the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission and the U.S. Geological Survey. After retiring from federal service, he returned to Cornwall Furnace, very good for us, uh, where he serves as a guide and researches the history of mining in the geology at Cornwall and similar deposits in Pennsylvania. One of Mike's ongoing research projects is studying the records of the Cornwall Division of Bethlehem Steel, which he is turned into a book called Always More Production, uh, which we hope to have printed uh, by the end of this year. So please welcome our speaker, Mike Weber. Thanks, Mike. And good evening to everybody on this rainy evening in June. It's only fitting that uh, we meet tonight to talk about Agnes and the demise of the Cornwall Mines. In about two weeks from tonight, we will solemnly commemorate the 50th anniversary of the death and destruction caused by Tropical Storm Agnes here in central Pennsylvania. I wanna thank you for joining us tonight for this webinar on Agnes and the demise of the Cornwall Mines. And as Mike introduced me, I am Mike Weber, and I wanna thank you for this opportunity to present. I'd also like to thank the Friends of the Cornwall Iron Furnace for sponsoring this webinar, and especially to Mike Emery, the Cornwall Site Administrator, and Kathy Donaldson, Treasurer of the Cornwall Iron Furnace Associates. After this brief introduction, I plan to review threats to mining operations and harbingers of those threats as they occurred at the Cornwall Mines. Then I will present summary information about Agnes including regional and local impacts of the storm and how flooding caused by Agnes ultimately contributed to the closure of the mines at Cornwall. I plan to leave plenty of time for questions and to listen to your comments at the end of my presentation. The photo on the right of this slide is of the Cornwall pit in spring 1973, about nine months after Agnes passed through central Pennsylvania. We often hear that Agnes flooded the mines and caused their permanent closure in 1972. Well, that is only partially true. By the end of my presentation, I hope that you can have a better understanding of how Agnes impacted the mines and how she contributed to their demise. As you see in this photo, the open pit in early 1973 is not flooded and mining of iron ore continued. So let's talk about threats to mines. There are a variety of threats that can cause or contribute to early closure of mines, both surface mines and underground mines. Three physical threats that can lead to mine closure are pictured here, including rock falls and earth slides, fires, and floods. As you see in the photos on this slide, all three of these threats occurred at the Cornwall mines. In the photo on the left, you see a major rock slide in the east side of the Cornwall pit that occurred in May through July of 1950. In the middle photo, you can see miners in their firefighting gear entering the number three underground mine in January of 1953. And in the photo on the right, you see Furnace Creek at flood stage flowing past the old passenger rail station at Miners Village in 1925. Although falls, fires, and floods posed hazards to mining operations and hampered ore production throughout the life of the mines at Cornwall, they did not succeed in forcing the closure of the mines. That is until 1972. However, how the flooding contributed to the demise of the mines is a bit more complicated. In addition to these physical threats, the threat of running out of ore or ore depletion can also cause the premature closure of the mines. It is important to remember the economic component of mining operations. Mines operate as long as they can turn a profit. 
if the value of the ore decreases substantially, or if the economics otherwise shift in a way that reduces or eliminates a profit, mines can be forced to close, even though significant quantities of ore remain in the ground. The photo you see on this slide is the 72-inch trailer jaw crusher that remains on site today near the number four shaft of the number four mine at Cornwall. You can tell that it is not operated for 50 years, uh, or uh, as you see in this picture, because the crusher is coated with a thick layer of rust. Now, flooding of streams and rivers in Pennsylvania is really nothing new. Native Americans who inhabited these lands before the arrival of the Europeans expected the Susquehanna and Delaware rivers to flood about once every 14 years. Analysis of stream gauging data from Pennsylvania rivers since the late 1800s revealed that major flooding occurs about once every 25 years in Pennsylvania. Although the severity and frequency of such flooding has been decreased by flood control measures, significant flooding continues to occur in the state. Major flooding is often associated in Pennsylvania with three different conditions. First, prolonged and moderate rains over large areas that occur in the winter or early spring months, particularly when rivers may be choked with ice and land surfaces are coated with snow and ice. Second, prolonged and heavy rains over large areas during the summer and fall months, which are often associated with tropical storms that ride up the Atlantic coast or frontal systems that stagnate over the mid-Atlantic states. And third, torrential rains that deposit very large amounts of precipitation over short periods and small areas, such as occur during severe thunderstorms during the spring, summer, and fall. A hydrologist named Shank reviewed flooding of streams and rivers in Pennsylvania in great detail and identified peak floods that have occurred throughout the state, and they're listed on this table. The table lists the peak floods at the locations and rivers in the state by comparing flood crest levels with flood stage or bank full levels at each location. Three of the peak floods on the Susquehanna and Schuylkill rivers in this chart occurred in 1972, whereas peak floods on other rivers and at other locations occurred earlier as far back as 1889. We have anecdotal information about other large floods on Pennsylvania rivers from Native Americans and earlier colonial settlers. However, we lack the specific data that would be necessary to compare these floods with more recent ones since 1889. If you're interested in Shank's assessment, I should point out that it is documented in a publication from the Pennsylvania Historical Museum Commission, and it's for sale at the Cornwall Iron Furnace. Now, turning our attention more locally, I assessed flooding events that adversely impacted the operation of the Cornwall mines. Because of the threat posed by flooding and the impact of weather on mining operations in general, Bethlehem Steel Corporation kept detailed records of flooding, precipitation, temperatures, and other weather conditions at Cornwall. I focused my assessment on the period for which I had the most detailed information, from 1925 in the lower left-hand corner through 1972-1973 in the upper right-hand corner. I also limited this chart to significant flooding events which disrupted mining operations for at least uh, several hours and as long as several months. As you see on this chart, significant flooding events occurred fairly frequently at Cornwall with an average of one event every three years or so. Most of these events involved large rainfalls that flooded the bottom of the open pit and damaged equipment that operated in the surface mine. For example, flooding often inundated steam and electric shovels, crushers, and the pit pocket at the base of the open pit. The pit pocket was used to load skip cars with ore. When the floods occurred, the miners had to drain the water from the pit using pumps and then dry out the electrical and steam components of the machinery before mining operations could be resumed. At times, miners used, for example, large infrared lamps 
and drying ovens to evaporate water from the electrical components. Flooding also hampered operations in the underground mines, the number three and the number four mines. Such events usually made the ore too wet to process through crushers, screens, and conveyors. Flooding events also transported large amounts of muck, silt, mud, and ore finds into operational areas of the mines, which then, of course, had to be removed. So as you see on this chart, the Cornwall miners were no strangers to water, and operations were frequently delayed or impeded by flooding. Remember that ore depletion can also threaten the continued operation of mines. In the 1700s and most of the 1800s, the miners at Cornwall viewed the ore deposit as essentially inexhaustible. This was certainly understandable given that the miners were removing tens to hundreds of thousands of tons of ore each year, and that was a small part of the overall deposit. When the Pennsylvania Geologic Survey assessed the Cornwall deposit in 1885, for example, they forecast that mining of the ore could continue for decades at current rates without significantly depleting the deposit. At about the same time, however, ore production rates began ramping up to four or five or 600,000 tons annually or more. Cornwall Mines produced a million tons of ore for the first time in the year 1905. At these production rates, it did not take long for the miners to see their virtually inexhaustible ore deposit begin to get exhausted. Mining companies keep close tabs on ore reserves that remain at the mines. Not only does this information help tactically by planning how best to extract the ore, but it also helps companies strategically plan and prepare for mining at other locations after the ore reserves are depleted. Available records, as you see here, demonstrate that Bethlehem Mines closely tracked the ore reserves at Cornwall. In 1951, for example, the company forecast 30 million tons of ore remained at Cornwall, and depletion of the deposit would occur in about 1966. This projected depletion date bounced around over the ensuing years as ore deposits were assessed in greater detail and as production rates varied. By 1965, Bethlehem Steel projected ore depletion by October 1972, including consideration of the recently assessed East End ore body that was being developed at the time in the eastern end of the open pit. In July 1972, after Tropical Storm Agnes, Bethlehem Steel uh, projected only 70,000 tons of ore remained in the number three mine, and the number four mine had already been overdrawn by 328,000 tons of ore. The fact that the number four mine was overdrawn may seem unusual, but it is actually quite common in mining to overdraw ore deposits. All that really means is that the miners were able to produce more ore than was originally forecast to be mineable. So let's turn our attention to Agnes. On the 14th of June, 1972, a tropical depression formed over the Yucatan Peninsula and grew into a tropical storm over the warm waters of the Western Caribbean and Gulf of Mexico on June 17th. Forecasters named the storm Agnes, which developed into a weak hurricane on the 18th of June, barely exceeding the minimum threshold for hurricanes with sustained winds of 75 miles per hour. Hurricane Agnes made landfall near Panama City, Florida on June 19th and quickly degraded in intensity. Little did forecasters know at this time that by the end of her track up the Atlantic seaboard, Agnes would become the most costly and impactful hurricane at that time, with damages exceeding $2.5 billion and causing 128 fatalities. As a result of her significant impacts, forecasters permanently retired the name Agnes from the standard list of names for Atlantic tropical storms, and Pennsylvania Governor Milton Schapp at the time would soon name the storm Hurricane Agony. 
Now, this image depicts the track of Agnes from her formation over the Yucatan on June 14th until she became an extratropical cyclone on June 23rd. That's at the top of the track. As seen by the colored dots along the track, Agnes matured into a tropical storm and then a hurricane before coming ashore in Florida. She weakened to a tropical depression soon after coming ashore on June 20th. As a result, forecasters and emergency planners lost interest in this relatively weak storm. However, as the saying goes, it's not over until it's over. After driving through Georgia, South Carolina, and North Carolina, Agnes began to strengthen thanks to a storm front in the southeast and warm waters off the Carolina coast. Agnes achieved tropical storm status for a second time on June 21st. The storm intensified, achieving its lowest barometric pressure of 977 millibars or 28.9 inches mercury and broadened to a diameter of about a thousand miles before coming ashore for the second time over Long Beach, Long Island, New York on June 22nd. After deluging the mid-Atlantic states for several days, Agnes merged with the front over New York, formed an extratropical cyclone on June 23rd, swooped over South Central Pennsylvania, and then traveled across Southern Ontario on June 25th. Agnes then headed across the Atlantic Ocean toward Great Britain before being absorbed by another extratropical cyclone on July 6th. Although the storm track does not appear too menacing, the real story of the impact of Agnes is told by the precipitation the storm deposited on central Pennsylvania. This map from the National Weather Service and the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration shows the precipitation deposited by Agnes as she tracked up the Atlantic coast of the United States. The colors on the map show the total amount of precipitation from Agnes with deep orange, purple, and then blue showing the highest amounts of precipitation. Most of Pennsylvania, as you can see, received more than seven inches of rain from Agnes. Harrisburg International Airport recorded 15.8 inches of rain during the three days that Agnes lingered over Pennsylvania. And the maximum recorded precipitation from the storm was in Clingerstown, western Schuylkill County, which received over 19 inches of rain during that same period. The impacts of the heavy rains from Agnes were intensified by wet weather experienced by Pennsylvania before the arrival of Agnes. As you see in this chart, about three inches of rain had fallen on Lebanon in June before Agnes arrived on June 21st. When this rain is added to the rainfall from Agnes and the rains that followed later in June, Lebanon received more than 17 inches of rain in June 1972. Now, during a typical year, Lebanon receives about 43 inches of precipitation, both rain, snow, sleet. In 1972, about 40% of that standard amount of precipitation occurred during the month of June alone, with 13.6 inches of rain from Tropical Storm Agnes. As I previously mentioned, the impacts of Agnes were record-breaking in 1972. The storm caused severe flooding on the Susquehanna, Lackawanna, and Schuylkill rivers, as well as on streams in the region like Swatara and Quidapahilla. As a result of the flooding, a number of cities in Pennsylvania suffered significant damages, including Harrisburg, Wilkes-Barre, Scranton, Reading, and Lebanon. Within Pennsylvania, Agnes caused over $2.3 billion in damages and 50 deaths. More than 100,000 residents of the state were forced to evacuate during the storm and flood damage left more than 200,000 people in the state homeless. Even the governor, Milton Schapp and his family, had to evacuate the recently built governor's mansion near the Susquehanna River in Harrisburg. In addition to the 68,000 homes and 3,000 businesses that were destroyed or significantly damaged, the storm dramatically impacted transportation infrastructure with 569 bridges destroyed or closed 
over $300 million in damages to roads in the state. Further, the storm uh, caused over $120 million in crop losses. Agnes, in addition, had a devastating impact on the Pennsylvania railroads, many of which were already bankrupt, with rails and bridges washed out, rolling stock flooded, and shipments substantially delayed. Penn Central Railroad incurred over $20 million in damages alone. These impacts accelerated the creation of the federally financed Conrail Corporation. The regional impacts were generally consistent with the local impacts. In this slide, we see several photos of flooding in the Lebanon area. The Lebanon Daily News called this flooding caused by Agnes the worst disaster in the history of Lebanon County. Other severe floods in Lebanon County occurred in 1889, which by the way, happened to be the same year as the catastrophic Johnstown flood, and 1925. However, the flooding caused by Agnes was much more severe. As a result of the flooding, Lebanon County was declared a national disaster area along with other parts of the state and nearby states. A Jonestown resident, Robert Hernley, drowned in floodwaters at Frog Hollow, where Tara Creek flows under Route 72 in Lebanon County. Flooding of the Lebanon Daily News disrupted publication of the newspaper, caused over $2 million worth of damages, and destroyed a large amount of newsprint paper stored in the basement of the newspaper. The Pottstown Mercury came to the rescue by loaning its presses to continue publication of the Lebanon Daily News during the newspaper's recovery from Agnes. The centennial edition of the Lebanon Daily News published on July 28, 1972, about a month after Agnes, featured a front page review of the impacts of Agnes in the 1972 flood. Flooding of the Quittapahilla Creek caused substantial damage to the Bethlehem Steel Complex in Lebanon. As you can see in these photos, the creek quickly crested over its banks and flooded the furnace buildings and other manufacturing facilities in the Bethlehem Steel Complex. In the photo on the left, you can see flood water surrounding the building that contained the 10 megawatt turbine generator that produced power for the mines and the concentrator at Cornwall. In the middle photo, note how the flood waters washed away ballast underneath the railroad tracks at the plant. On the photo on the right, you can see additional buildings that were flooded by Quittapahilla Creek and its tributaries in Lebanon. Now, these photos were taken by Dr. Marlon Hauer, Sr. During Agnes, Dr. Hauer served as a physician for Bethlehem Steel. Unfortunately, Dr. Hauer passed away in April 2015. We're indebted to him for taking these photographs, the only ones that I've seen that actually show the flooding of the plant during Agnes, as well as for his many years of medical service to the Lebanon community. The flooding in Lebanon had a direct and severe impact on operations at the Cornwall Mines. Early in the morning on Thursday, June 22nd, the 48 inch pipe that diverted Furnace Creek around the east side of the open pit failed and flooded the pit. This pipe had been reinstalled and upgraded in 1964 in preparation for mining the east end ore body in the pit. Then at 8.15 on the morning of June 22nd, still on Thursday, the 25 cycle frequency converter at Lebanon Power Plant flooded, which caused an immediate loss of power to the pumps and the other machines that were used to operate the Cornwall mines, as well as the concentrator plant and the pellet furnaces at Cornwall. With the loss of power in the mines, there was no way to continue to pump water out of the deep mines and out of the open pit. By about five o'clock or 1700 that afternoon, miners reported that the pump room on the 12, 25 foot level of the number four mine was flooded and the water was rising. At 10 o'clock that evening or 2200, miners reported that the pump room on the fifth level of the number three mine was also flooded with water levels continuing to rise. The water levels in the open pit were rising concurrently as more and more water poured into the pit from the broken 48 inch diversion line and from runoff of the adjacent slopes. By the time power was restored partially from the power plant in Lebanon at 
1830 or 630 p.m. on Saturday, June 24th, hundreds of feet of water had accumulated in both of the underground mines and in the open pit. In the number four mine, water levels had risen above the 1075 foot level. That's 150 feet above the sump at the 1225 foot level. In the number three mine, water levels were in the second level of the mine, which meant the water was far above both sumps in the mine. And in the open pit, water levels were above the 320 foot level. The mines were flooded and mining could not resume until the water levels were lowered. As the rain subsided in late June and Pennsylvania residents began to assess the damage from the flooding, Bethlehem Steel launched an engineering study to assess the next steps. In July, Bethlehem Steel Corporation decided to close the underground mines permanently. This decision was based on two overriding considerations. First, miners had already removed most of the ore that remained in the number three and the number four mines. As you saw before on slide eight, only 70,000 tons of ore remained in the number three mine. That would be about two months worth of ore. And only a small amount of ore remained in the number four mine. Second, it would have been prohibitively expensive to rebuild and repair the infrastructure necessary to resume the underground mining. The pumps, the tramming locomotives, the scraping hoists, and the other equipment that had been inundated by the flooding. Concurrent with the decision to close the underground mines, Bethlehem Steel decided to continue to mine iron ore from the open pit through at least the end of 1972. Consequently, the company began lowering the water level in the pit to allow resumption of mining, repairing the 48-inch diversion pipe on the east side of the open pit, and laying off, transferring, or retiring 371 men who were no longer needed to support the mining operations of Cornwall. Some of the workers transferred to furnaces at Steelton and Lebanon or to the Grace Mine in nearby Morgantown, Pennsylvania. Most of the workers, however, were laid off due to a lack of work or they retired. In December, 1972, Bethlehem decided to continue mining ore in the open pit through the end of June, 1973. Although production rates increased throughout that year of 1973 and shortfalls were compensated for by processing foreign iron ores, mining ended at Cornwall on June 30, 1973, as the last truckload of ore pulled out of the pit at the end of the day, as you see on the right side there. Thus ended 236 years of mining at Cornwall, one of the longest continually mined ore deposits in the United States. Throughout the remainder of 1972 and the first half of 73, management's focus at Cornwall was on safe and efficient operation of the mining in the open pit and processing the ore at the concentrator. After mining ceased in June, the Bethlehem Cornwall Corporation proceeded with the sealing of the underground shafts at the number four mine. As you see in the photo on the left, the number four shaft at the number four mine was sealed using reinforced concrete on August 24th, 1973. And in the photo on the right, sealing of the number five shaft of the number four mine followed soon thereafter on September 13th, 1973. Although the shaft for the number three mine should have been sealed in a similar manner, I could not find any record of the sealing. The seal should be located at the collar of the shaft where it ascended out of the ground on the north wall of the western end of the open pit. At the time the mining operations in the pit concluded on June 30th, water levels in the pit were sufficiently low that sealing would not have been disrupted by the rising water levels. The monuments that remain today for the closure of the mines 50 years ago are shown on this slide. On the left is the plate that's embedded in the seal of the number four shaft, including the date August 24th, 1973, more than a year after the mine was permanently shuttered in July, 1972. 
The plate in the seal of the number five shaft is more descriptive, and you see that in the middle photograph, including the date of the power loss and flooding on June 22nd, 1972, and the date of sealing on September 13th, 1973. The miners embellished the plate for the number five shaft in recognition that they routinely entered and departed mine number four using this shaft. The flooded pit provides a monument to the hundreds of years of surface mining at Cornwall. After mining ended in June 1973 and cleanup operations in the pit concluded later that fall, groundwater and surface water gradually flowed into the pit and the water levels rose several hundred feet higher than they were during mining. Today, the lake in the pit is about 300 feet deep and serves as a reservoir for Elizabethtown, Pennsylvania. As stated in the London Daily News in June 1972, we will never forget the damage caused by Agnes and the flooding of 1972 here in central Pennsylvania. This damage included the closure of the Cornwall iron mines soon thereafter. The demise of the mines was especially poignant for the miners who lost their jobs and the families who lost the principal employer in Cornwall after hundreds of years. So at 8.15 a.m. Wednesday, June 22nd, about two weeks from now, pause for a moment of reflection about the demise of the great iron mines at Cornwall and the bravery, the dedication, and the sacrifices of the miners and their families. Thank you for your attention this evening. I'd also like to thank the friends of the Cornwall Iron Furnace and especially Mike Emery, site administrator and tonight's host, and Kathy Donaldson, the treasurer of the Friends and our webinar host behind the scenes. Now I'd be happy to answer your questions or listen to your comments. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mike. Uh, I'll open up with just a couple of, of comments before we actually get to some of the questions. And we do have some good questions coming in. Uh, of course, we have uh, several people that are watching us tonight uh, that work for PRL. Uh, so they're very familiar with the open pit. Uh, we have uh, Jay Angelo's daughter who took many of the photos that you've used uh, over the years. Uh, she's on, as well as the daughter of Dr. Howard. Uh, who also took some of the photos that you used in, in, your, uh, in your presentation this evening. And then, of course, several people said, oh, you're Dr. Howard's daughter. He was my doctor. So there's lots of connections and people that are on tonight. So that's always great to see those connections uh, being made. So, all right. So I'll, I'll get to the questions. Uh, some of these I think you had gone over just a little bit, but I think they, they bear out. Uh, and, and also some of these are common questions. So I think they really uh, bear to be examined a little bit further. So uh, the first question we have here is from David. And, uh, and he, he asks, how hard would it be to reopen the mine if they really wanted to? <laughs> um, so it could be done. It would just be a very expensive proposition. And of course, uh, whatever company decided they wanted to do that would have to go through a large number of administrative and legal hurdles uh, to seek the permission to resume the mining of the ore. Uh, in my own view, given the small amounts or relatively small amounts of ore that remain at Cornwall, it simply wouldn't be worth uh, the time or the frustration <laughs> or the money uh, to extract that iron. Uh, though, you, though you said that this is still listed as a strategic reserve for cobalt? That is true. So if someday we make cobalt batteries instead of lithium <laughs> batteries, we might be able to see that, correct? Yeah, a wise one once told me, never say never. Right. But it would be very difficult, is what you're saying. Difficult, timely, costly. Expensive. 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 Uh, so another question we have, and again, this is a, another uh, kind of a common question. Uh, so Ed writes that he's heard stories kind of all his life about equipment that was just left underwater and at the bottom of the open pit. And is that true? 
Uh, clearly, equipment was left underwater in the deep mines. They did pump down the water levels to some extent to recover materials and equipment that they could for salvage purposes. Uh, in contrast to that, in the open pit, they drained the open pit or they lowered the water level sufficient to allow, allow them to continue to mine the pit for another year basically after Agnes came through. I have seen pictures of the pit, uh, both during 19, the end of 1972, throughout 1973, and during the several months that it took them to decommission the open pit. Uh, and it was during that period where they had to go through and remove any kind of hazardous chemicals, oil. Uh, and most of the photos show that the pit was fairly well cleaned uh, in terms of machinery at least by the time they closed it down. All right well thank you Mike. Uh, here's here's another question and this is I think more of a general question but it gets to the numbers that you that you showed uh, like in the 1950s and 60s the calculations of ore. And uh, Chris, I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, so Chris asked, how are those calculations made? Like how, how are they coming up with those numbers? Uh, so throughout the life of the deep mines, uh, Bethlehem Steel, of course, measured as best they could uh, how much ore remained. Um, so a lot of those estimates are volumetric measurements based on core drills that were uh, drilled throughout the rock. And from detailed analysis of the core samples that were extracted from those drills uh, and ore analysis, you know, not all the ore was the ore that they were specifically looking for. They wanted the, the richer, the higher graded ore, not the less uh, concentrated ore. Uh, that's that's how they calculated the the mass of ore that they were extracting, and then throughout the life of the mine, they would frequently update that estimate at least on an annual basis, if not more frequently, uh, by examining what they had extracted uh, during the previous year, and then how much uh, mass of ore remained for them to mine. It, it does look a little uh, confusing, and I went back to the slide here, because for three of those years, it was the exact same reserve estimate. And that's why I referenced in my remarks that, in fact, uh, this is an approximation, right? So you're not trying to estimate it down to single ton quantities. But uh, as they further refined the estimate of the ore remaining, that changed the amount of reserves. And as they factored into their calculation how much ore they were continuing to produce on a monthly and an annual basis, that also impacted that estimate of the time remaining until they depleted the ore body. Okay. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> yes, and, and and you and I have had conversations about how early even they were making these calculations, that even in the 19th century, you know, they're doing borings, that they're trying to figure out how large is this uh, body of ore, and just like a lot of other science, as you get more information, you change the estimate, because you have now more data to go off of, so... Yeah, we are fortunate at Cornwall because they they did, in fact, uh, characterize that ore body very well throughout the life of the mine. And uh, the drilling that you're referring to, Mike, uh, back in 1872, 1873, that was instrumental in coming up with those longer term forecasts. Certainly Bethlehem Steel did not want to acquire the deposit until they had sufficient confidence that that deposit would be able to supply them with sufficient ore that would make it worth their while to take over that operation. All right, now here's another one. So 
I think this is more of a question probably of the mid 20th century. How many Bethlehem steel plants did Cornwall iron ore supply? Yeah, it's difficult for me to know that because I don't have records uh, from uh, Bethlehem Steel. Uh, the Bethlehem uh, Mining Corporation records that I have access, Bethlehem Mines Corporation, uh, did indicate when they shipped directly to some of the furnaces. So we know that they shipped to Steelton and to Bethlehem and to Lackawanna and to a Sparrow Point uh, and to Lebanon, of course, but uh, I don't know how many other furnaces were ultimately supplied by ore from, from Cornwall. And we know uh, in the earlier period from records from even the 1860s, you know, they were supplying about, what, a dozen and a half different furnaces, some of which owned by the proprietors of the, uh, the ore bank company, but many others that were not. So over the life of the mine, it supplied many, many, many different furnaces, not just what was here in Cornwall, not just what was here in Lebanon County, but over a fairly, you know, large uh, geographic area. Right. Absolutely. So, all right. So here's a question. What controls the water level of the open pit today? The water table and uh, the outlet that's near the machine shop uh, on the north side of the open pit near PRL. Right. So it fluctuates. It fluctuates. Yeah. Some. 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 <laughs> but I know on days that it has rained quite a bit, uh, I know how much vol more volume is coming out of Furnace Creek because I can hear it from the parking lot. Right. And on most days I can't. So, you know, I, I know that that uh, Furnace Creek level does change just, just on that. So, uh, so where does the water come from that fills the open pit? Uh, a lot of the water that's today in the open pit comes from Furnace Creek. That's uh, flowing uh, on the southeast side of Miner's Village and flows into the open pit in the southeastern corner of the open pit. But other water that flows into the open pit is groundwater. So it's uh, penetrating through the soil and then down through the upper uh, part of the rock and, and then flows out into the open pit because the open pit is a what's called a sink now in the local uh, groundwater system uh, there at Cornwall, because you're artificially maintaining the water level low, which means uh, with that outlet near the machine shop. So that draws, that allows the water to flow into the open pit. All right. So here's a question. Uh, the mine, uh, I have, let me see, I'm, I'm gonna paraphrase this. <laughs> uh, so the mine closes in 1973 in June. If it had not flooded, if the mine had not flooded, how long would mining have gone until? Like what, what date? Yeah, it's difficult to say, but I would have been surprised if it had gone much beyond 1974. Uh, they were producing a fair amount of ore from the East End ore body, and they had an, another hundred or so feet of ore to exhume out of the East End ore body. And had they continued to operate, they would have continued to mine ore out of both the number three and the number four mines. <coughs> Excuse me. I think the number three mine probably would have been depleted by the end of 1972. But they would have, I would have expected, continued to produce ore out of the number four mine. Um, so that's my guess based on what I understand remains underground today and the rates at which they were producing the ore. Of course, that depends on a lot of variables that, uh, you know, it's just a wild guess kind of thing. Right, right. So this is, this is one that I, that I know you know a, a little bit about, quite a bit about. Uh, are there records that show how much ore was mined from the mine from opening till closing? 
Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, do you want more than that? <laughs> I, I I figured I maybe just give a little bit more than that. So okay. So from 1742, when Cornwall Furnace began operating, until about the 1850s they approximated how much ore was being produced based on how many furnaces were being fed by ore from Cornwall mines and the approximate amount of ore that those furnaces needed to consume in order to remain operational. Uh, so that gives us the earliest estimates. Beginning in the 1850s, uh, when uh, more care and control was being administered in the mining operation because of the growth of that operation and the need to avoid uh, one miner group uh, dumping waste rock on top of another mining group's ore, <laughs> uh, uh, they began to keep much more detailed records. And then the Cornwall Ore Bank Company was formed in 1864 to further foster that coordination among the miners and the people who owned the mines. Uh, and that led to very detailed records being kept until Bethlehem Steel took over a controlling interest in the mining operation in 1916. And of course, uh, we have detailed records from uh, Bethlehem Steel Corporation in how much ore they produced throughout the remaining life of the mine. That all said, the general uh, estimate of the amount of ore produced from Cornwall mines was 106 million tons of iron ore. A lot of iron ore. A lot of iron ore. So another thing that you know quite a bit about, uh, someone asked, did they ever have a mining accident that you know of? Oh, yeah. Uh, so one of the unfortunate things in mining iron ore is that the ore itself is dense and heavy when it's present in large chunks. Uh, and that leads to a lot of hazards. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the talk I gave on safety in the mines last October, and you can find a video of that webinar presentation on the Cornwall Iron Furnace's website. But if you don't want to watch that, uh, yes, many accidents occurred over the lifetime, the operation of the mines. Uh, we are also aware of about 40 uh, casualties that occurred during the years that Cornwall was mined. And these are people who gave their lives uh, as part of the mining operation or as part of the operation of the concentrator plant, which was also necessary to produce the ore uh, to feed into the furnaces. So uh, the most common accidents that occurred were accidents involving large chunks of ore falling off either the top of the ceiling of the mine or off the side slopes of the mines in the open pit and uh, men were crushed by the ore. Uh, and then beyond that, there's a whole host of other accidents that occurred uh, over the lifetime of the mines. And that's in part what I referred to when I talked about the sacrifice of the miners and the families, uh, because in some cases, the miners didn't come home and uh, their families had to deal with that. All right, Mike. Uh, we have a gentleman, Al Metley, uh, and he's, he uh, writes, could you please review the timeline uh, for when the mines lost power? I was working in the number four mine on that day, and I rode the skip to get to the, fur, uh, to the surface. My father-in-law, Bernard Beard, had walked out of the mine after electricity was lost. Thanks, Al. So as you see on this slide, this is slide 16, uh, power was lost at the mines at 8.15 on Thursday morning, the 22nd of June. And that's when the 25 cycle frequency converter flooded and then failed at the Lebanon power plant. So that's when they lost power. 
um, there was some, uh, let's see, there was some 60 cycle power that was on site at the concentrator plant and also at the surface mines or the surface plants at the number three and the number four mines. But most of the heavy machinery, including the hoists and the tramming locomotives, um, uh, used the 25 cycle uh, power. So that may make it, I wasn't there, uh, and it's an honor to hear a miner who was there on the day that power was lost uh, uh, on this webinar. <laughs> And, but that may, I bring that up because that may have led to some confusion about when power was actually lost. Okay, thank you very much, Mike. A uh, couple of questions about the, uh, the water itself. Uh, there's questions on uh, what the quality is of the water. Uh, there's a question of how E-Town became the recipient of <laughs> the water. Uh, and also what E-Town uses the water for. Okay, well, I'll answer those to the best of my knowledge. <laughs> Understood. Uh, so the water quality in the pit today, uh, which is probably similar to the quality of the water that's in the flooded number three mine, is a fairly good quality water. Uh, I don't have the analytics uh, at my fingertips, uh, but it is a backup water supply for Elizabethtown. And uh, I understand that Elizabethtown acquired it when a Cornwall borough declined to acquire it as a backup drinking water supply. Uh, my understanding is of course consistent with uh, EPA requirements and Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection requirements, the water would have to be treated before it was introduced into a, a drinking water supply uh, or drinking water pipeline. But uh, it, there's a lot of uh, animals that live in the water, uh, fish, uh, so to the best of my knowledge, it's, it's pretty good quality water. I was going to say the same thing, Mike. I mean, when you look at the life that's in that stream, uh, it's all things that kind of show high quality uh, water. Uh, because I've seen streams in Pennsylvania in which nothing grows, uh, which nothing lives in. Uh, and this is very far from that. I mean, you see, you, know, you pick up a rock in the stream and you see lots of things wiggling under it, which is usually... Yeah. A kind of a good indicator of how healthy uh, the water is. Midge larva and yeah, right, and crayfish and you know, right, like that. So, right. Uh, so question from Pat. Can you? Oh, can I? Can I add something else? Oh, sure. Uh, getting back to Elizabethtown, uh, as I understand it, it's it's a backup supply or backup reservoir for Elizabethtown, so they don't use the water on a continual basis. Uh, but if they needed the water, there's a way that they can pump it uh, down to Elizabethtown and then introduce it into their water treatment system. Okay. Sorry. No, quite all right. Uh, Pat Freeland's asked, can you describe how miners got out of the mine? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, again, this isn't too well documented, but from what I understand from miners who were there at the time, uh, they, they knew when the power failed that they had to get out of the mine quickly because the only reason the areas that they were mining in uh, were habitable was because the pumps were pu uh, pumping the water out of the mine. So when those pumps shut down due to lack of power, that was time to get out of the mine. <laughs> uh, I don't know if that's clear enough, but uh, it wasn't like they heard, you know, rushing water flowing. It wasn't like they were in some catastrophic deluge in the underground mines. Uh, the foreman and the mine superintendents knew when the power failed they had to get the miners out of the mine. Okay. 
We just have uh, time for just a few more here. Uh, we have someone asking uh, kind of a more basic question. Uh, where did ore go after it was mined? What industries and companies use the ore? And what finished products were created from that iron? Wow. Okay. So I'll keep it. So you short. might want to generalize that yeah. to, uh, you know, a decade or a time period. Otherwise, it could be here for a while. Yeah. So most of what they were after was the iron. And that iron, after it went through the concentrator plant, was then sent to uh, furnaces. Uh, and by by the end of the mining operation, most of those furnaces were producing steel. And that steel was used to produce I-beams uh, for building construction, for bridges, uh, for rails, for uh, appliances, uh, you know, feeding all the things that we as consumers appreciate today and make our lives a lot easier. Um, uh, of course, in addition to the iron, they were also able to recover copper, uh, gold, silver, and cobalt. Uh, those metals were sent off-site for additional processing uh, at various locations, Wilmington, Delaware, uh, Long Island, Michigan, uh, Canada. And, uh, and then they were used for uh, electrical components, for you know, precious metals, uh, for strengthening steel in the case of the cobalt. Um, so hopefully that's a, a sufficient answer. Very, very good. Um, so let me go ahead. I have just one or two more here. Here's a, a good question. Was there any downstream damage when pumping out flood water from the open pit during the many floods in the 1900s pre-1972? Was the water sent into the furnace in the Snitz Creek, or was that something that was sent elsewhere? Uh, so it's a function of when the flooding occurred. Uh, before the early 1950s, uh, the water quality, water discharge requirements were a lot more lax than they were after that time period. Um, some of you may be familiar with the uh, sedimentation ponds, the settling ponds that were built for both the number four, the number five, and the open pit mines. Uh, and they were built in the 50s. And so subsequent to their construction, uh, they would have ensured that the quality of the water being discharged from the mine was suitable for introduction into uh, streams in Pennsylvania. Before that time, it would have been a function of uh, how far before that time. Uh, certainly our recognition of the impacts of large discharges, including discharges of water with uh, large amounts of sediment in, uh, has uh, been enhanced over the years. So, for example, during the 1925 flood that occurred and flooded the pit, which prevented the operation of the mining for about a month in both the pit and the number three mine. Uh, my guess is they discharged that water directly into Furnace Creek and flowed into Snitz Creek. And it may have had adverse impact on the aquatic uh, communities downstream, but uh, that's long since washed down the channels. <laughs> right, right. Um, so we have someone uh, on here, uh, Jeanette, said that her cousin Jack Metley was killed in 1969. He was run over by a skiff. That's one of the, I think, one of the accidents you document. Yeah. Uh, and also, Andy, uh, I'm, I'm not going to say the last name correctly, I'm sure. Uh, Horesco would like to talk to you sometime about uh, what his father did in the mines in regards to drilling and estimating the amount of, of ore that's there. So oh, that'd be great. Um, I'll see, I can go ahead and see if we can get you an email uh, for him. So okay. I or, or come to the furnace on a Friday. <laughs> oh, that's true. Uh, absolutely. Yes. Uh, Mike is here just about every Friday uh, giving tours. Uh, and our nickname, Mineral Mike, uh, gives, gives uh, not only tours of the furnace, but would also uh, talks a great deal about mining. Uh, so 
if you want a, a really great tour that focuses on mining, I want to talk about that. Friday is a really great day to come. So, Mike, I just wanted to show this last picture, which is why I advanced to it. Okay, please. So before I used this picture, but you really couldn't see much of it because it was much smaller. But this is the southeast corner of the open pit, and you can see the water just cascading down over those walls. And if you look up in the upper left-hand corner, you'll see that 48-inch pipe with the water just gushing out of the pipe and then uh, causing a, a, a cascade down the, the wall of the pit. So I just uh, thought that was a fitting end to our talk tonight about Agnes and the demise of the mines. Okay, well, thank you very much, Mike. I think that that's all we have time for uh, this evening. And of course, we'll have uh, have this recorded if people want to go ahead and see things. And again, they can uh, always come and visit the uh, the furnace on a Friday and, and we can discuss this further. So, uh, so thank you very much, everyone, for joining us uh, this evening for this lecture. I especially want to thank uh, Mike Weber uh, for his presentation and for Kathy Donaldson uh, for helping to organize our virtual talk. Of course, I'd also like to thank uh, the friends of the Cornwall Iron Furnace who sponsored this program. Uh, many of you uh, probably uh, are already members of the Friends of the Cornwall Iron Furnace, but if you'd like to really support programs like this and other programs at the furnace, I do encourage you to uh, become a member. It's a very inexpensive way to support a local organization, and you'll get a newsletter uh, with really great information and, uh, you know, know, have the satisfaction of supporting uh, a good local organization. And if you or your business would like to sponsor a future lecture, please contact the site uh, and uh, for further information. And of course, donations are always gladly accepted. So please join us for our next lecture, which is on Tuesday, July 12th. Uh, Michael Showalter, uh, the museum educator at the Alfred Cloister, will present a talk entitled Room Enough for Them All, the people of Lancaster County in the 18th century. Of course, that includes here at Cornwall, which was throughout much of the 18th century, part of Lancaster County. So also just a reminder, the museum is now open Friday through Sunday. Please check our website for details and for tour information. Uh, also a reminder on this Saturday, June 11th, uh, we have our rescheduled cast iron cooking, which will go uh, 11 uh, to 3 p.m. And also the Keystone Band uh, of Raresburg will also be playing a concert that day from 1 to 3. Uh, both events are free. We gladly take uh, donations. We'll also be running tours that day. The tours, however, though, will be at our, our normal cost. Uh, if you would like to come, bring a lawn chair, uh, stay the day, and, and hope for uh, good weather. So please stay safe, everyone, and good night.